So Michael and Kathy Rock, we've uh, enjoyed hummingbirds for almost our entire 25-year marriage. And the ruby-throated hummingbird, they're migrating. We've had our feeders out now for a couple of weeks. We've not seen one yet, but there have been hummingbirds seen in the Madison area. So we'll talk about migration here shortly. So we're going to hear from Kathy for her introductory part of the presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be with you this morning, but I know that Michael is going to do just a fantastic job with this program for you. This is our most exciting time of the year because hummingbirds are returning to Wisconsin once again. And actually the very first one was seen on Sunday, April 23rd, uh, which is very exciting. We haven't seen one yet. We typically don't see our first hummingbird until the second week of May, but we're looking forward to that and, and we hope to share our excitement with you today. We've traveled all over the United States talking to banders and other people who are very passionate about hummingbirds. One of those people is Nancy Newfield who wrote this wonderful book called Hummingbird Gardens. And she's a master bander who lives in New Orleans, Louisiana. And she, in her beautiful handwriting, wrote this inside of her book to us. Michael and Kathy Rock, Hummingbird Gardens Make Hummingbird Magic. So I truly hope that we can share a little bit of that magic with you today as we talk about hummingbirds and how to create your very own backyard oasis for hummingbirds. And by the way, this is our little friend Harrison. He travels with us to every one of our programs. He's not a real hummingbird, but he's pretty darn close. So thank you so much. And on that note, I'd like to introduce my husband, Michael Rock, who's gonna be speaking about hummingbirds and gardening. So the first question we're often asked is, how many different kinds of hummingbirds do we get in our yard? And the answer is one. Uh, there's about 328 to maybe 340 species of hummingbirds. They are only in the New World, so uh, North America, Central America, and South America. No hummingbirds in Europe or Asia or Africa or Australia. Uh, the, the largest number of hummingbirds is at the equator. As you go north and south of the equator, there's fewer and fewer hummingbirds. Uh, we have in the U.S. maybe 15 to 17 hummingbirds, but east of the Great Plains, the only nesting hummingbird is the ruby-throated hummingbird. So all the pictures of ruby-throated hummingbirds you see will be in our yard, and we'll show you where we live here shortly. This is a hatchier male. Some people would say juveniles. Technically, the term is hatchier. So the summer that I took this picture, this little guy hatched. He's got, it's a little bit, well, you can kind of see it. He has this stippling in his throat area, and he's got one little red feather coming in. Uh, in his upper chest, that's some fight damage where his feathers have been abraded because hummingbirds are highly territorial. They fight each other. Uh, as he matures, oh, I should also point out, he's got white tips to his, wing feather, to his uh, tail feathers. As he matures, he will have the fully developed throat area, which is called the gorget. And it's called the ruby-throated hummingbird because it has a ruby red color. Now in this picture, it's not ruby red. And that's because the bird and the sun and the observer all have to be lined up properly. And he's looking off towards his left. Also note, he doesn't have white in his tail feathers anymore. He now has a deeply forked tail. So here's gonna be another hatchier male. He's got more than just the one single red feather that the one in the center of the, of the photo ha has. He's turned a little bit towards his left, but he's gonna uh, look a little bit more towards my camera. And there's the ruby red color. So just imagine when this gorget area is totally filled in, you get this 
brilliant red, a ruby red color, and they use that and then these U-shaped dives to attract females. Now for the females, the adult and the hatchier are pretty much identical. No uh, gorget feathers. They both have white tips to their tail feathers. So they're pretty much impossible to tell apart. If you see a non-adult male in the spring, in May or June, you know that's an adult female because uh, they haven't been here long enough to, uh, to breed and, and nest and, and hatch. So the, the, uh, the female types that you see in May and June, those are going to be adults. So the ruby throat is the only nesting hummingbird east of the Great Plains, but not the only one you will see in Wisconsin. Every year, somebody will be lucky enough to get a rufous hummingbird. So these are hummingbirds that nest in the Pacific Northwest, the western coast of Canada, and even in Alaska. And like the ruby throat, they are supposed to migrate to Mexico and Central America for the winter. But every year, these hummingbirds will wander into the states east of the Mississippi. So our friends Larry and Emily Shaneman had this hummingbird in their yard for a month in 2009. So he looks really different than the ruby throat. He's got this uh, brown or rufous color on his back, the top of his uh, head, his chest, and his gorget flash would be more of a golden color than a ruby color. Uh, they, will, they will go on and leave. So the, some people say they're lost and they need to be captured and relocated. They do fine on their own. And in fact, many people on the Gulf Coast, including Nancy Newfield, who, who Kathy talked about in the video introduction that wrote the Hummingbird Gardening book, the people on the Gulf Coast, they maintain gardens in the wintertime. Oh, okay. They maintain gardens in the wintertime because there's a population at a rufus now that instead of migrating to Mexico and Central America, they spend their entire lives in the United States. And there have been, these hummingbirds have been banded and recaptured in the Pacific Northwest. So we will leave our feeders out well until after the last ruby throat has departed. We'll leave some feeders out up until Thanksgiving, hoping that we would see one of these in our yard. Hasn't happened yet. We know a couple of people within two miles of our house that have had rufus in their yard. So it's a myth that if you leave the feeders out, it, uh, it discourages the birds from migrating. They migrate based on the length of daylight, and there's nothing you can do to prevent them from migrating. And you can help out hummingbirds by leaving feeders out into the fall. This is a satellite view of Madison. If we zoom in to the near west side, on the right side of the slide is Hildale Mall. The Blackhawk Country Club golf course is at the top of the slide. Uh, Oscar Randall on Park is almost in the center of the side. And then the letter A uh, is where our house is. So we're right here in the city. And uh, many, many years ago, we were told, well, you live in the city, you won't be able to get hummingbirds. We've been able to do that by lots and lots of feeders and lots and lots of flowers. Now, you can do one or the other. You could do the feeders only. But hummingbirds really like going to flowers. Uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, it is a little bit of work to maintain feeders. So we devote pretty much our entire garden to gardening for hummingbirds. Right now I have four feeders out, one in the front yard and three in the backyard. When we get into August to September, my total number of feeders will be probably close to 20. Uh, it's a lot of work, but uh, by maximizing feeders and flowers, we really think you can get more hummingbirds, and they're just so much fun to, to watch. So there's a couple of different migration maps. Uh, this is a map by Lanny Chambers, who has the hummingbirds.net website. He has colored dots. That have, uh, there's a key in the lower right-hand corner that you can see the northern progression of the hummingbirds. He stopped doing his mapping project because the software he was using was, is no longer free. So there is another mapping project, which is Journey North, which is based here at uh, the UW Arboretum. Uh, this is from 2019. And they also do color-coded dots. 
So you can see the northern progression of the hummingbirds, and hummingbirds have reached Madison. So this is a, a good time of the year to put out uh, feeders. We've never had a hummingbird any earlier than April 30th, which is tomorrow. But normally we see them sometime in the first week of May. So what do you put in feeders? You put in nectar. Two ways to do this. You can get a pre-made mix or you can make your own. Now, I have a slash through this pre-made mix because some of the pre-made mixes have red food coloring in them. You don't need that. Red is on the feeder, and that's what attracts the hummingbird's eye. Now, although there's some hummingbird mixes here at Wild Birds, they don't have any dye in them, so they are safe. Uh, so I make my own, and it's a ratio of four parts water to one part sugar. So the way to remember that is your hand. Four parts water, one part sugar. Some people boil the, the water with the thinking, that well, that, quote, sterilizes the solution. As soon as you hang it outside, it's no longer sterile. So I just use hot water out of the tap, which makes the, the sugar dissolve more quickly. And it's a responsibility like having a pet. The nectar becomes moldy. It looks cloudy. You can actually see dark pieces in there after, depending on the temperature, after maybe even a few days if we're into the, like the 90s in the summertime. So you do need to change the nectar. I said every four to five days here. Uh, I rinse them under hot water in the sink. And then something I'll do maybe once a month is a water bleach solution, a 10 to 1 ratio. And I don't measure that. I measure the proportions of water and sugar exactly. But for the water bleach solution, I've got water in the kitchen sink, put in a splash of bleach, let the feeders sit there for 10 minutes, rinse them off, and then that really gets them nice and clean. So we're going to look at different kinds of feeders. This is one of the more popular styles, previously called the Perky Pet Four Fountains Feeder, also known as the, now it's known as the Pinch Waste Feeder. Uh, there's two hummingbirds in this picture, one on the perch at the bottom, and then one uh, at the top of the slide on a little red, uh, red wire. This feeder was in a hailstorm. So you can see on the right side, that fake gloxinia flower, it had a chip of it knocked out by hailstone. Note the level of the nectar. I don't fill my feeders up all the way because I know I'm going to be changing the nectar every four to five days or week, and I don't have enough hummingbirds to drain my feeders. So I only put, uh, fill them up uh, partially. So a lot of hummingbirds come to this feeder, and I see some over there on, on the shelf of the Perky Pet Pinch Waste Feeder. So they really seem to like that. This is another view. I even take off the fake gloxinia flowers. Uh, right now, I don't even have the yellow bee guards on because bees are not an issue. They become an issue later on in the summer. But this is later in the summer. This is an adult male because you can see he's got the fully filled in gorget. And the white dots in the background is it was late in the afternoon. Sun was lo low in the sky. This feeder is near our in-ground pond. And I've got a mister that's shooting mist up into the air. And all those white dots is the mist. So... That's kind of a fun picture. You put feeders where you can enjoy them. We had a suction cup device on the second floor in our bedroom. And so this is right outside our bedroom window. We could be right up, up to the glass on the inside and had the windows open. You could hear the birds arriving and leaving from the buzzing of their wings. So this is something called the Artline Balloon Feeder. Some people don't like the kinds of feeders I showed, which are a little bit of work to clean. Those feeder ports on the Perky Pet Four Fountains feeder, if you don't do the bleach solution, uh, you need to, sometimes you need to clean them out with a brush. And I'm sure there's different kinds of, kinds of brushes or almost something that looks like a, a lady's mascara applicator that you can put into that hole to clean it out. The saucer-style feeders are a little bit easier to clean out. You just pop off 
that top, the red top, and then you can easily wash out the inside. The hanger in the middle, there's an ant moat. And so you can fill that with uh, water, and ants can crawl down that hanger, but they cannot swim across water. There's also separate ant moats that I'm sure are here somewhere that you can also put above feeders. And I'm not seeing them right now, but I'm sure they probably have some ant moats here. This is a durable feeder called the Dr. JB's Clean Feeder. It would never be harmed in a hailstorm because it's got really thickened plastic. It's kind of a hybrid between the Perky Pet Four Fountains and a saucer style feeder. And then this is a feeder that's used quite a bit in our yard called the First Nature Feeder. This is another adult male. This is in a tree right outside our dining room window. And we took this early, oops, one spring. Uh, they may not sell this style anymore. This has big oval holes in it. They now have a style that has two parallel slits. I'm not sure how much the hummingbirds use that. The one drawback of this first nature feeder is yellow jackets can get inside those big oval holes. You can twist open the bottom of that and wash out the yellow jackets. I don't think they sell this style of feeder here at Wild Birds. So I'm often asked, have I ever found a nest? And the answer is no. Uh, although last, actually for the last year, uh, there is something called Hummer Helper nesting material, which is up here. And I had... I had this in our yard last year. I saw a hummingbird picking at that. It's white, unbleached cotton. And this hummingbird flew away somewhere. I could not track her to see where she went. But she was using that to line a nest somewhere. So we probably had hummingbird nesting somewhere within a mile of her house. Our friends Larry and Emily Shaneman, who had the rufus, this is a nest that they found in their yard in a maple tree. They have a detached garage and their son saw the female go to the nest. And that's pretty much maybe the only way you could uh, ever detect this because the nests are tiny, tiny, tiny. Think of a walnut and cut it in half. That's the size of the nest. She camouflages the nest with lichens, so that's the green flakes on the outside of the nest, so it blends in with the leaves. And then the diameter of the surface of the nest is the diameter of a quarter. She does all this work on her own, lays two eggs that are the size of Tic Tacs. So it just shows you how tiny uh, this nest is. So I would love to find a nest someday. So we've been to a conference in Sedona. There's a hummingbird festival there every year, late July, early August. And there's scholarly presentations from people. There are people that get grant funding, that study hummingbirds. They publish in birding journals. And sometimes some of these discoveries make it into the popular culture. So here's a video of that. Here's a fascinating story I saw that on the news. Um, research at UC Berkeley recently discovered how hummingbirds keep themselves dry during the rainy season. Now take a look. Well, we know that hummingbirds flap their wings incredibly fast, and they're really quick at something else. Researchers at UC Berkeley wanted to know how hummingbirds deal with wet weather. So they sprayed water on the birds, and then this slow motion footage revealed a surprising answer. Oh, wow, that is really interesting. We like to inject some humor in our presentation. So normally at this point I turn over the presentation to Kathy, but uh, I'm going to continue on without her. Uh, I enjoy the gardening too, and in fact I've got a number of seedlings under grow lights that I started in early March. Uh, the perennials are coming up right now. Uh, we have a lot of annuals in our yard, as you'll see, and it's too cold to put the annuals out. So that will happen maybe in mid to late May. So we think these are elements of good hummingbird gardening. Feeders, which we've already talked about. Uh, if you don't want to do the feeders, that's fine. But realize right now when the hummingbirds are arriving, 
They don't go to the spring blooming flowers. They don't go to daffodils. They don't go to tulips. They don't go to crocus. They could go to uh, Virginia bluebells, and we have some of that in our yard, although we've never seen them at our Virginia bluebells before. So I really think feeders and flowers maximizes hummingbirds in your yard. Trees, shrubs for cover, perching, and preening. You think about hummingbirds being so frenetic, chasing each other, flying around all the time, but they actually spend 75% of their time perching. So you really have to have trees. Flowers, shrubs, and vines that attract hummingbirds, which we'll talk about the, the flowers. Water features, I uh, talked about our pond and had the mister, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. And then we have something we call hummingbird beacons. One can go to the dollar store, particularly around Valentine's Day, and get things like this for a dollar. Hummingbirds are naturally attracted to the color red, and they can see red maybe for as much as a quarter of a mile away or even, or even longer than that. Uh, so we put uh, hummingbird beacons out into our yard. This is a view of the walkway to our front door. So we make an extensive use of pots. Because of the cool Wisconsin climate, some of you, so many of our flowers are tropicals, but pots you can put onto hot concrete, and they're easier to, to, to manage. You can move them around if you want to. One thing we struggle with in our yard is the city has uh, locust trees between the sidewalk and the street. And they've just grown huge in the 25 years we've learned, lived there. And we have so much uh, shade now. And a lot of the flowers like, uh, like full sun. So we have all of these flowers leading to our, our front door. And most of the flowers you're seeing here are salvias, which we'll talk about. The salvia family is a great family of plants for hummingbirds. This is a view of the east side of our side yard. And we have uh, flowers there in front of the fence. We have some trumpet creeper. Uh, so extensive, extensive garden. This is our in-ground pond. There is the feeder that that adult male was at. And we saw, the, uh, we saw the mist in the background. The mist there is in the middle. There's a recirculating pump in the back. And there's a well underneath this mister where I have the, the pump and it recirculates the water. It's got pea gravel on the bottom, and the depth of the water is, I don't know, maybe no more than half an inch. Hummingbirds are tiny. They're the size of your thumb. They would not use a traditional bird bath, which is deep, because it's just too deep for them. We have seen some videos of hummingbirds that would take a dive into water. In fact, there was a great program on PBS recently that showed that. Uh, but the hummingbirds will fly through the mist. And oftentimes, after a rain, you can see hosta leaves behind the pond. They'll do leaf bathing. So they will be fluttering on those leaves and rubbing their body on the leaves to bathe themselves. This is a little bit of work because I don't have it going in the wintertime. I think uh, uh, the water would freeze and it would break the pump. So I need to uh, clean out my pond in the next few weeks and, and get it going. So okay, we're going to talk about perennials first for hummingbirds. The very first one that uh, blooms for us is honeysuckle, Lanocera sempervirens. There's the Dropmore scarlet, which is the tr traditional color. There's a newer variety, newer being a relative term, maybe in the past decade or so called Major Wheeler, and we have a bunch of Major Wheelers in our yard. They have a more reddish color than, than the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Dropmore Scarlet. Heaviest bloom in the spring, but it can rebloom during the summer. So this is a picture of a hummingbird, I think at one of the Major Wheeler honeysuckles. It needs a support structure to grow on, so we've got it growing on a fence, we've got it growing on a shepherd's hook, if you had a mailbox by the street, you could have it growing in on that, but it does need something to grow up on. Cat mint. So this is not catnip. We have cats inside, but this is cat mint. Nepeta gigantea. This is a variety called Six Hills Giant. 
It's coming up right now in our yard. And these flowers you can see are blue. They're not red. And earlier I mentioned hummingbirds are attracted to red flowers, but they will go to any flower that has a nectar reward for them. And this flower has nectar in it. So uh, they, they like the, the cat mint. There are some smaller cat mints that you can find in garden centers. We tend to shy away from those because hummingbirds don't like to be close to the ground because there could be a feral cat uh, predators near the ground that could, that could grab them. So this blooms in the spring shortly after the, uh, the honeysuckle. Uh, Jacob Klein bee balm, Monarda didyma. There's all sorts of different colors of bee balm, but we found that the Jacob Klein variety works the best. We've had other, other colors in our yard, uh, and it just doesn't attract the hummingbirds as much. Uh, so they really, really like the bee balm. The only drawback of this is it blooms in early to midsummer, a fairly short blooming period of maybe six weeks or so and then they're done and they tend to get powdery mildew on the leaves and look kind of ugly. We just only wish that these these flowers bloom later in the spring. Uh, I'm sorry, later in the summer. We have the largest number of hummingbirds in our yard in August to September because that's when the fall migration is happening. The adult birds go first and then the hatchier birds go secondly. Uh, and the peak of the migration is in our yard in mid-September. I'll show you our website address a little bit later. It's also on the handout, hummingbirdgardening.net. I've not updated the website yet, but our uh, public hummingbird garden tours are on September 13th, which is a Wednesday, and September 17th, which is a Sunday. Uh, we often have a hummingbird bander there who's an avian zookeeper at the Milwaukee Zoo and she bans hummingbirds. If there's any young people there, they get to release the banded hummingbirds. Uh, and uh, we hope we'll have a, a good showing of hummingbirds uh, this September. And we set those dates in stone, so it, it happens rain or shine. A hummingbird bander does not band in the rain. Anyway, this is a, a excellent perennial of hummingbirds, but we just wish it bloomed later in the season and bloomed for a longer period of time. Now, many of these plants I'm showing you are not, not native plants. I know some people are big into native gardening. Uh, butterfly bush is not native for the U.S., and in fact, it's banned in some states because it can become invasive. Not the case for us, so we've not had it invasive in our yard. But this is butterfly bush or Budlia davidi. Uh, if you don't have hummingbirds in your yard, you'll get butterflies to go to this. So tiny, tiny little flowers, and it's amazing to see the hummingbirds, they just spend a fraction of a second at each flower, they just, just along the, the flower frond. So just amazing to see hummingbirds work over these flowers. It's perennial. Uh, a lot of people tell us, well, gosh, I have trouble getting my butterfly bush to come back. The key is don't cut it down until the spring, because we cut it down to the ground, but we do it in the spring. If you do it in the fall, you've got an open cut there, water gets into that, it freezes, kills the roots, and then your butterfly bush, bush is dead. So I'm expecting, since we had a relatively mild winter, we never had a polar vortex, uh, that all of our butterfly bushes will come back. We have lost some in previous years when we, that, that winter we had the polar vortex, but this usually reliably comes back for us. A cardinal flower, this is a native flower, uh, excellent flower for hummingbirds. Uh, does okay in shade, partial shade, it probably would, would like some sun. It really likes wet feet. So if you have a sandy soil, it may not do as well. Uh, we have a very rich soil because our house used to be University Hill Farms. Uh, and we keep our butterfly bushes uh, watered very well. We see them coming back. This flower actually probably co-evolved with hummingbirds because bees cannot, probably cannot pollinate this flower very well. A hummingbird reaches the nectar with its long beak and then the hummingbird's tongue extends much, much further beyond the beak. 
And this, hum this flower is configured just correctly in order to have the hummingbird pollinate it. You can see the stamen, it's tapping the bird on the head. And this hummingbird has a white dot of pollen on its head. So it's going to be transferring that pollen from one flower to the next. So great, great flower for hummingbird. Blooms late in the season. And that's good because that's when we have the most hummingbirds. This is not an adult male. It's either an adult female or could be a hatchier male. I, yeah, I think I'm seeing a five o'clock shadow stippling on this bird. So this is a hatchier male. Uh, August, some people say Augustaki, some people say Augustashi. There's all sorts of different varieties of this. Uh, there are perennials of varieties of this. We've not had good luck in having them come back because of our rich soil. This would like more of a sandy soil. So a lot of our Augustashis we grow as perennials. I'm sorry, we grow as annuals. Uh, we do a lot of these in pots and we just treat them as annuals. We have a friend of ours that's into gardening, hummingbird gardening, who lives in Red Wing, Minnesota. He has a number of raised beds that he's amended the soil to make them very, very sandy. And I think he's had success in getting these flowers to come back. Uh, some are perennial, some are annual, but we pretty much treat these as annuals. Come in different, different colors. This is a reseeding annual. So it's not exactly a perennial, but it reseeds. It's called flowering tobacco or Nicotiana mutabilis. There are small little bedding flowering tobaccos you can get in uh, the garden centers. This is taller. This easily can get as tall as maybe up to my nose. Uh, the flowers kind of change color from a white to a pink. Uh, it reseeds vigorously. And the hummingbirds really, really like this at the end of the season. It blooms really, really late in the season, like August to September. Uh, and if it becomes a nuisance, it's really easy to pull out any unwanted uh, volunteers, but it reseeds all over the place. So now we've shifted into the annuals. So this is honeysuckle fuchsia. Uh, this is a variety called Gartenmeister Bonstedt. It has flowers that kind of look like the honeysuckle flower we saw, we saw earlier, the Lanocera sempervirens. Uh, does not like really, really hot sun, so don't put it in full sun. We have this in shade to part shade. Now, hummingbirds use this a little bit. I cannot say it's really a top-tier hummingbird flower. This is a nice annual you can find in the local garden centers. This is one of the most favorite flowers of hummingbirds that's an annual. This is Mexican cigar plant. This particular variety is Coupfia David Verity. And uh, they really like these flowers. This is an uh, adult male that we named Harry many, many years ago. We took this, uh, I took this picture. He came to this pot on our deck about the same time every day. This David Verity variety, unfortunately, is hard to find, almost impossible to find in local nurseries. But another variety has been developed that's called Vermillionaire, and you can readily find that in local garden centers. We've seen that at the Bruce Company here on the west side. We've seen it at Klein's on the east side. It's easy to find this, and it looks pretty much identical to the David Verity. So we have this in a number of hanging baskets and hummingbirds really, really like the coupfia. Uh, there's another variety called batface. We've had hummingbird gardening friends that have had success having their hummers go to batface coupfia. We tried it one year. They really didn't go to it very much for us. There is a variety of coupfia that's coupfia ignea. Uh, and we've not seen hummingbirds use that very much. I think the the flower size is so tight, it's too small for their bills, which is amazing given how small hummingbirds are. But I would shy away from the Coupfia ignea. Uh, now we're going to start talking about salvias, a wonderful, wonderful family of flowers. This is Salvia gorinitica, or anisage. Uh, excellent, excellent flower for hummingbirds. 
prefers sun, you can see that the the flower, it's engulfing the entire hummingbird's head. I think our next slide is a video. This is a video of a hummingbird going from flower to flower uh, at all this salvia gorinitica in our front yard. What I showed you on the previous slide is the plain variety which is difficult to find locally, but we're gonna talk about some of the varieties that you can find. I had a little bit of trouble with the camera following the hummingbird. There it is again. You can see some kupfias there in that picture also. I've, I'm often asked, well, if you could only plant one flower for a hummingbird, what would it be? And it's hard to, hard to choose because the flowers don't necessarily flower throughout the entire season. But I guess if I had to choose one, it might be uh, in, anything in the Salvia gornitica family. Uh, this you can find locally. This is Salvia gornitica black and blue. It has black calices that hold the blue flowers. There's also another one that's very available locally called Black and Bloom instead of Black and Blue. You can find that at the nurseries I mentioned earlier. K&A has their relatively new greenhouse out on Mineral Point Road. They've had a good uh, selection of hummingbird flowers. So you probably can't find the, the one that just has the green calices, the plain Salvia gornitica. But Black and Blue or Black and Bloom you can easily find. This is kind of an offshoot of Amistad. This was a chance, uh, chance flower that was found in the wild by a salvia expert, Rolanda Uria, who lives in Argentina. And you can generally find this at some local nurseries. This plant gets absolutely huge. I mean, it can get easily as tall as me. And uh, it blooms really, really late in the season. I'm doing an experiment this year, which I hope is going to be successful. These form these, I don't know if technically if they're tubers or rhizomes, but I've, I've dug up the root ball, just stored them in just trash bags, and I'm going to replant them, and supposedly they should be able to come back from that, so that will save some money in buying new plants. This is a salvia gornetica called purple and bloom, which is relatively new. Maybe it's been in existence for the last three years or so. Uh, it works good in, in, pot, in pots. So hummingbirds really like this, and you can find this locally too. Uh, so this is an excellent, excellent uh, plant for hummingbirds. Salvia gornetica, purple and bloom. Uh, Purple Majesty, huge, huge plants. These can easily be taller than me. They bloom very, very late in the season. Uh, can't really find it locally. You have to do it by mail order. And one drawback of this is the stems tend to be a little bit brittle. And if there's a big uh, windstorm, they tend to, to break off. So we've actually not grown the Purple Majesty now in a few years. But it's a great photo that I took. And in the background, there's a hint of something we'll see in the future, and that's uh, cannas. Texas sage or salvia coccinia, uh, good plant for hummingbirds. You can get plants in the, nurse, in the nursery, but if you want to grow th things from seed, this is easy. Buy the seed, and I made a mistake a number of years ago where I made a trench. I put the seeds in the trench, covered it with dirt. No. Sprinkle the seeds on the ground, water them, they come up. So that's how you plant these. And hummingbirds like the Texas sage or salvia coccinia. Salvia gregi comes in all sorts of different colors. This is called Navajo red. Uh, we do salvia gregi mostly in pots, and they like to go to that. This is a, a relatively good photo that I took. There is something called the skyscraper, skyscraper series of salvias. So this is salvia skyscraper orange. It looks more reddish to me, but that's what they've called it. Uh, 
There's also, I think, a skyscraper pink that we've had in our yard before. You can often find these locally. Bloom late in the season. Uh, hummingbirds love, love these. So the salvia family is just a great family. There are perennial salvias that you'll find in the garden centers. Those are old world salvias, meaning they're from Europe. Hummingbirds don't go to that, which is surprising. But if you get like salvia nemorosa, hummingbirds won't go to that. So you really need the new world salvias. Now this is salvia Wendy's Wish. This was a chance hybrid that was found in Australia. And there are no hummingbirds in Australia. But uh, the hummingbirds like the salvia Wendy's Wish. The Wish series has proceeds that I believe go to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So that's a nice idea. There's salvia Wendy's Wish. There's salvia Ember's Wish. There's salvia Love and Wishes. And there's salvia Wishes and Kisses. And the hummingbirds would go to any of those in the Wishes series. Uh, this is in a hanging pot. You can see it's on a shepherd's hook. So we always have some of the Salvia Wishes series in our yard. You can see the Kupfia. It's either Vermillionaire or David Verity, also in this photo. What's so much fun about hummingbirds and gardening is you're combining the two. If you like gardening, if you like hummingbirds, it's a perfect marriage of doing both together. So it's really such a, a fun hobby. So canna, I mentioned earlier, canna indica. Now there are cannas that have really fancy frilly flowers. This is the more simple kind of a flower where it's got the single flower tube. And it's hard to see the hummingbird, but it's, at, it's right there in the middle of the picture. And it gets the nectar reward from these flowers. These, you dig up the rhizomes, and I store them either in peat moss or just in boxes uh, in the basement, and then replant them this, in the spring. So it's a little bit of work at the end of the season, chop off the green part, dig up the rhizomes, and store them. They will multiply, so then you'll be sharing them with your friends. Uh, and if anybody actually wants some of these, we could probably share them with you. Kathy's email address is on the handout or you can find it on our website, and uh, we'd be happy to share some with you. We generally don't plant them until the nighttime temperatures do not go beneath 50 degrees, since these are tropical plants. Uh, zinnias. Uh, this is actually one of my best photos from a point-and-shoot camera, and it froze the wings. It's not blurred because I had bright sun that day. So... Uh, zinnias are kind of like salvia coccinea. You just sprinkle the seeds on the ground. And the hummingbird, kind of like the, the butterfly bush, goes really, really quickly from flower to flower and flower uh, in those yellow flowers there in the center. Uh, zinnias truly are an annual. So our website is hummingbirdgardening.net. I'll put those dates of the garden tour on the website. I'll work on that later today. The one on Wednesday the 13th is from 3 to 7 p.m. On Sunday the 17th, 1 to 5.30 p.m. We don't know if Hummingbird Bander will be at one date or both, date, both dates. And again, if it's rainy, she w doesn't band in the rain. But uh, uh, you're welcome to come. Our friends Larry and Emily from Whitewater who had the rufus and the nest they often come and set up a table in our yard and do a little class on hummingbirds. So everyone's welcome. It's free, open to the public. This is a video. Now let me just start playing it because I don't remember which one it is. Oh, the professional videographers made a video called A Place in the Garden, and they shot video in our yard and Larry and Emily's yard. So that's a butterfly bush that's called, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now. It'll come to me in a moment. That's a Salvia gornetica. There's the Nicotiana mutabilis. That's a Salvia that, uh, the name escapes me right now. We do quite a bit of our uh, plant acquisition via via mail order. That's a hatchier male. There's another Salvia gornitica. And then there's one on the feeder, and there's going to be a chase.
Here's the second one, chased it off. Uh, we were in Costa Rica for Kathy's 65th birthday at a place called the Peace Lodge. It's about one hour north of the San Jose airport. And twice a day they take down their feeders, they give the guests handheld feeders. And here's what happened. And I, I cannot tell you what kinds of hummingbirds these are. They're not ruby throats, but how much fun is that? Uh, we've never been able to hand feed hummingbirds in our yard. They're just too wary of us. So, wonderful place to stay. It's the only place we went to in Costa Rica. I know some people rent cars there, but we spent uh, vacation there for Kathy's 65th birthday. This was one year prior to the pandemic, so this was 2019, I believe. Yep, it was, okay. Oh, we wanna go, okay. And this is a video, I was standing on our porch in September uh, and I took a video with my camera of all the hummingbirds just buzzing around all of these salvias. You can see the street there in the background, but this was just an amazing amount of activity we had in mid-September. A little bit hard, maybe somewhat to appreciate on this flat screen TV, but it was so many hummingbirds chasing each other, it was too many to count. No, no audio for this. During the fall migration, you have waves of hummingbirds coming through every day. So they probably only spend a few hours in your yard and then they're replaced by a new batch of hummingbirds. They migrate singly. They might happen to be in the same space at the same time. But what's amazing about these hatchier birds is they don't follow their parents. They know when it's time to go. They know where they're going and they know when they've arrived at their destination. It's all imbr in imprinted in their brain, which is the size of like a BB. So just amazing what these birds can do. The only bird that can fly backwards, they can temporarily fly upside down. They weigh about the amount of maybe a, like a nickel or so. So it's like three point. Thank you everyone today for your kind attention. And we hope that you've learned a little bit about creating your very own hummingbird garden and hanging a feeder to, to attract hummingbirds to your own yard. We truly hope in your journey of hummingbirds that you'll go out and plant a salvia or two, a cupvia or two, so that you too can enjoy these exciting uh, jewels. So uh, to close the program, I'd like to read a quote from our favorite hummingbird video called Hummingbirds Up Close. The hummingbirds have captured our hearts and we embrace their picadillos together with the endless joy of their company. To feel the wash of the littlest angel's wings as it caresses the hand which just hung the feeder brings out the best in us, for no other bird can catch the sun and toss it back to us. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. So one other thing, we worked with Mickey O'Connor, who's the hummingbird bander at the Milwaukee Zoo. We worked with her and this brochure from the Wisconsin Society for Ornithology was put together. We worked in the gardening part. So I have a stack of them up here. If anybody wants this, it has some suggestions about flowers. We have many, many more flowers on our website. There's a page called the Gallery of uh, hummingbird flowers in which, oh gosh, there's probably 50 or more different varieties of flowers on there. So you only saw a portion of them today, the, the ones that we would consider the top tier flowers. So with that, I'll take questions. Bob, did you need to say anything right now?
Okay, questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question I'll repeat, size of the pot and how many different kinds of flowers? Not really. Uh, oftentimes, Kathy has a pot that's probably a diameter like this, and she might put two or different kinds of flowers in there. But it, you can get creative with pots. You probably don't want to put two or three in a tiny little pot that was only like that size. But the, the bigger kind of pots, you can put in multiple flowers. We have one perennial salvia in our yard that attracts hummingbirds. It's salvia azuria, uh, A-Z-U-R-E-A. -E uh, it blooms really late in the season, like in September. It has these sky blue flowers. Hummingbirds do, do go to that. It's not easy to find. The flower factory had it in the past, but they're closed now. Uh, you can find some seeds online. You might have to look online to see if you could get any plants, but salvia azuria is the only perennial salvia that attracts hummingbirds. We do have some salvia coccinia that reseeded, and it's coming up right now in pots. So it sometimes reseeds if you have a, uh, if you have a, a mild winter. Uh, you, uh, you're, you're next. <laughs> Yeah, the question was, could, if they stayed in Wisconsin, could they live over the winter? And the answer is absolutely no. They can't tolerate the Wisconsin temperatures. No. The rufus that we saw, that hummingbird that had the brown back, they're a little bit more cold hardy, but even they could not tolerate uh, Wisconsin winter. There's No. So there's no hummingbird that would live in Wisconsin in the winter.